countdown. There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Goldman. Um, I work for Facebook at the moment, but really sort of PHP is my, my career, my life. I've been working on the PHP runtime for uh, at least the past dozen years or so. Um, so it's, it's definitely one of my passions. So I'm, I'm excited to be working on a project like HHVM. Um, it's uh, pretty cool for me. And I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to be here in L.A. Um, I actually grew up out in San Gabriel, not too far from here, so this is, this is my, my hood or something. Um, it is so hot down here, though. I miss NorCal, the best California. Um, uh, also, also an alumni of, of UC, so that's, this, is, this is double my hood here. So. Um, but let's get on. Um, HHVM, what is it? It's, um, it's sort of PHP, but not. Um, it's the PHP that Facebook uses to run all of our production traffic. HH stands for Hip Hop. Sort of the original name of the, uh, the runtime was Hip Hop. Uh, it came from HPHP, sort of high performance PHP, but funny story, the license for PHP says you can't use PHP in the name. So we had to come up with something clever out of HPHP and that became Hip Hop. So there's your source of the name. Uh, HHVM is the Hip Hop Virtual Machine. This is sort of the latest incarnation of hip hop, as it were, this high performance PHP. And performance really is sort of the, the key piece of HHVM. Uh, but there's a lot of cool things that have nothing to do with performance. They have to do a lot to do with developer efficiency. And I'm definitely going to take a look at those for you as well. So HHVM is not a source code transformer. When we first released to the public in 2010, I say we with my Facebook hat on. I wasn't there at the time. I was at Yahoo. Uh, we released as something called HPHPC, or the High Performance uh, PHP compiler. This would take PHP code, turn it into C++ code, and then shove that off to GCC to actually compile. Uh, needless to say, this took a very long time. Uh, one of the things I found out after I joined Facebook is that when the weekly releases would come up, we would take our PHP code base, which was 10 to the 6th or 7th line of code, a whole bunch of PHP. Um, we start using a scientific notation. You know it's yeah. a lot. Um, we would throw all of that code at the HPHPC compiler across a hundred machines doing the compilation together. Like compiling on one machine one is enough. It still took half an hour to build this executable. Um, needless to say, this was less than efficient for our developers. Um, so they actually tended to use uh, PHP regular for a long time. Um, where we're at now though, HHVM is a completely different animal. Um, it's, it actually functions as a complete drop-in replacement for PHP. Keep your same web server, keep your same database server, keep your same application, like say Drupal, and uh, just run it straight out of the box exactly the way you would expect to run it. It's going to run faster and it's going to give you a lot more toys to play with. So only the middle part of this picture disappears. We take PHP out, we put HHVM in this place. Um, when it, it runs anywhere as long as you define anywhere as a 64-bit Linux. It's like Ford, you can have... <laughs> I'm not even going to make the Ford joke. Everyone's heard that. Um, it'll actually run a few other places, but really we do focus on Linux because, honestly, what are your servers running on? Is anyone not running a production web server on Linux? All right. We got, we got one joker. All right. So what are you running? Windows. Windows? Really? Really? <laughs> Nothing wrong with Windows? Some of my best friends are on Windows? <laughs> Oh. Well, good for you. Uh, it has to be IIS, it's Windows. Um, we are actually working on a Win32 port for HHVM. Um, we have a Mac port as well, um, which mostly functions. The JIT's not 100%. Um, we're working on a Windows port as well right now. So that will come. Uh, what does HHVM support? Well, we had to rewrite PHP from the ground up, basically. Um, we took a few very tiny pieces of PHP, a couple of header files here and there. Uh, but mostly is a complete rewrite of the entire thing. That means not just the, uh, the engine and the runtime, that also means all of those uh, standard library functions and all of the weird quirkinesses that go with them. Yes, needles and haystacks are in the wrong order. Yes, they throw exceptions and warnings and notices when they shouldn't because, because PHP. Um, <laughs> I, I have a Facebook page called P Because PHP because every time I run into one of these things, I just sort of go, why? And I, I put that up, but that's never mind. Um, so we do, we have re-implemented all of PHP sort of from the ground up, and that means even modern uh, PHP uh, syntaxes like splats and variadics. 
Um, anyone not know what a splat and a variadic is? Good. Okay, well, a couple of hints. Um, splats and variadics are sort of ways of dealing with variable number of arguments. Uh, if you use func get args, that's replaced by variadics. You can declare dot 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 dollar r, and that'll be all the extra unnamed arguments, and then splats the reverse. So that's sort of the call user func array. Um, that's as far as I'll go into that. Um, generators, coroutines, namespaces, which are a little bit older, and then a whole bunch of other stuff that we've added um, to make the language sort of in Facebook's opinion, better. Um, I happen to th agree with a lot of these things. Um, I'm partially speaking on Facebook's behalf here. I'm partially speaking on my own behalf. I think these are some really cool things. Every time I have to write a website for regular PHP, and I do occasionally, I just sort of go, why, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Because it, it has made development so much more easy. Um, I had a burnout point in PHP, and I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and this has brought a lot of that joy and excitement back. And I'm hoping I'm, I'm sort of communicating that to you. So why wouldn't you run HHVM? It sounds great, right? Well, it is a complete rewrite, and we haven't gotten all the bugs wrong yet. So we only pass about 60% of PHP's uh, built-in regression tests. Uh, there's a good reason for that. 40% of those tests are really kind of clammy. Well, not all 40. Probably 20% of those are, are pretty clammy. They test for very specific error messages, um, sometimes error messages with bad English in them. Um, the, I won't, I won't go into those. I can spend all day on this. Um, some of them are extensions that were missing, things like Informix. A lot of you use that database these days, right? Or MSQL, you know. Um, we're very concerned about that, obviously. Um, so we don't worry about those. And honestly, what we really want to look at is how many of those frameworks and things that people are actually running their code on, how many of those were on HHVM? So that's our primary metric, and that sort of determines where we're going to look at parity matching next. And... Looking at GitHub, the top most used frameworks out there, the top 20 are clearly passing, and several of the, of, of the next 20 below that are clearly passing. Um, Drupal 8 is rocking it. Drupal 7 needs a little few tweaks. Um, not quite 100% perfect. Um, we actually worked um, we actually worked with Drupal to make a few changes to make it work cleanly on PHP and HHVM. So that's great. There's a good article down here. Um, this guy did some testing of Drupal 7 on HHVM versus PHP. I encourage you to take a look at that and judge those numbers for yourself. I just love the graphic. I think it's cool. Um, how hard is it to get running? Well, that depends on where you're going to run. Um, Heroku, as an example, uh, we worked pretty closely with them over the past year. You can run your application on Heroku out of the box on HHVM by just putting one line in your Compose.json file. That's it. You've now switched from running PHP to HHVM. Nothing else to do. Uh, they've got a nice blog and, and uh, wiki entry about that. Really easy to set up. Um, hopefully, we'll get some more people to, uh, to, to that point. Maybe Pantheon, as I'm winking at some Pantheon people out in the audience. Um, we can work on getting that going, because I know Pantheon's a great Drupal hoster. Um, we'll see where that goes. So let's say you're not on Heroku or whatever. Uh, you want to install it yourself. You've got a server you're going to run on. Well, we've got Debian packages. That's pretty cool. So anything Debian-ish, Ubuntu, whatever, just app get install, you're done, and it's running, and that's pretty cool. Um, if you're not on Ubuntu or one of those hosters that's already supporting us, then God help you. Um, it is buildable. Uh, it can take quite a long time to build HHVM. It's a very large project. It's larger than PHP. It takes a long time to compile everything. Um, this XKCD cartoon was never more accurate, especially if you're, build especially if you're building on a laptop. Um, I've got a 32 core dev server with a one gig flash card in it that I can build on pretty fast, but not everybody has that. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Check it out from GitHub. Get a few dependencies sorted out. Run CMake to configure it for your system, then run Make and go watch a movie. Um, it does require GCC 4.8 or later because we have a lot of G, uh, C++ 11 features um, being used. Um, we think they're pretty cool. C++ 11 has come a long way. And if you ever want to get out of PHP into C++, I recommend going straight to C++14 because there's a lot of really cool features out there. Because that's a natural progression, of course, PHP to C++11. <laughs> so let's say you've got a built and you're ready to go and you want to actually run your website. How do you actually set it up and turn it on? Well, exactly like PHP. PHP, you're going to run it in FPM mode most likely. You're going to have a block that looks almost identical to this in your Nginx or Apache configuration. Just do the same thing. FastCGI is a nice standard protocol, and the great things about standards are there's so many of them. 
So set up AGHVM with a configuration something like this. It says run me in fast CGI mode. Here's where my socket's at. Here's where uh, Nginx is going to look for me. And launch it in daemon mode. You're ready to go. And as far as you're concerned, you can forget that this is HHVM now. Because again, drop-in replacement for PHP works the same way. So that's great. Now, th this really has nothing to do much with HHVM itself or how you use it or how you do anything. But I want to take a quick divergence to talk about sort of our, o our open source uh, presence. Um, sort of how we how we get HHVM out to all of you guys so you can use it too. Because Facebook's been using this for several years now. Um, but it's really only become usable for everyone else in the past year and a half or so. And we do have a problem with that. When we first released in 2010, um, somebody, I can't remember who, went to FOSDEM, which I'm wearing the shirt for right now, to say, hey, we've got this cool new PHP runtime. It's called HPHPC, and it's going to change the world because it's going to run PHP so fast. It's like five times faster than where PHP was at that point. Side note, PHP's gotten faster since then. Um, we did a few things wrong. First off, you'll see this initial bump at the beginning. We threw our code over the wall. I say we, I wasn't even at Facebook at this time. Facebook threw the code over the wall and then ignored it for two months. That's good OSS strategy, right? No. Spent some more, some more time um, getting some regular updates out. Each of those peaks, that's one sort of like flurry of commit activity. The troughs in between them are nothing going on. Uh, certainly not looking at the issues. And then look over here, October 2011. Nothing. Off the map, gone completely dark. That doesn't mean nothing's happening internally. People are still working crazy at this, trying to make it faster and faster. We've already started work on the HHVM project at that point to uh, make it even more awesome, but we're just not there yet. Um, so this, this is how not to do open source. Especially the lack of documentation and ignoring the pull requests and the tasks. 2012. Um, I, I, I hate to brag, but this is when I entered the project. <laughs> You'll see a slight change in our graph here. Um, we, have, we got a heck of a lot better about pushing out regularly. I said, okay, we need a script to just like take our internal repository that has hip hop and a whole, a whole bunch of other stuff, filter it, get it ready for output, and push it out. Do that on a regular basis. Um, it was sort of semi-daily initially because it required you know, a George Jetson to push the button and then fix it when things don't go right because they didn't go right a lot. Turns out my scripts weren't perfect the first time I wrote them. Um, we also started to actually reach out to the community and actually interact with people. We opened up some social channels, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter, IRC, actually started interacting with people, paid attention to the pull request, said, hey, you're actually offering to do some work for us. Why don't we be appreciative of that and maybe pull some of these in? So um, sort of reset the project at that point. Um, and we got our build system working a little bit better, but it's still sort of a second class citizen. Uh, the build system we were using internally, and still are, is something we call FB Make, because everything has to be FB something. Um, it, is, it looks nothing like CMake, it looks nothing like Auto Tools. It's its own weird thing. Um, so the CMake build we had externally usually worked. And not somebody broke it, in which catch case it would probably stay broken for half a month or so. Fast forward to 2013. Um, HHVM has become our de facto internally. We're actually using it for all of our production uh, content on HHVM. We've automated a lot more of these processes. We are now pushing multiple times a day, so there's a lot less delay getting things out. We've said, okay, we've got 500 bugs out there, and we have no idea which one of these are even current right now. Let's just sweep those all under the rug and start over. So we're going to take bugs seriously now. Start getting us bugs. In the time since then, uh, we have closed more than 2,000 bugs. It's probably closer to 2,500 bugs since then. Properly closed. Like, oh, here's a problem. Here's a fix. Or here's a question. Here's your answer. That sort of thing. Um, we have closed, merged more than 900 pull requests, which in a year span is not too bad. Um, and we have uh, introduced support for third-party and optional extensions. Originally, you just had to do the kitchen sink, everything. Now you can actually turn stuff off you don't care about like you can in PHP, and uh, we have support for external modules like Pickle kind of stuff. So we're improving. 2014, let's see if we can improve that even more. Um, the push process is now completely automatic. There is no longer a George Jetson. 
It just works and it does it and we don't have to look at it. We've also got an automatic import process for all those pull requests. They come into our internal system where we can actually get them um, reviewed by everybody and landed. We've opened up a lot of those reviews. You can actually see the process that goes into deciding, you know, what goes, why a patch works or doesn't. Um, and uh, I think the last big thing that we're working on this year is getting included in some standard distributions and getting the Win32 and Mac builds um, sort of standardized so that you can just sit on your Mac and just say homebrew, install, HHVM, and a few minutes later have it running. We're not quite there yet, but that's part of our goals for this year. So that was a quick aside about sort of our open source pro process, um, why it was faux broken, and uh, uh, what we've tried to do to fix it since then. Um, we've got a good community going now. Um, a lot of these larger photos are people who have done some really big, significant contributions. Um, the guy over on the right, that's uh, Daniel Sleuth. He basically alone got us building on Mac. So if you're running this on your laptop, thank him. Um, somewhere in the middle here is Tim Starling. He has been throwing huge numbers of quality patches at us constantly um, to get uh, much better performance, much better uh, support for something we call EZC or XZen Compat Layer. That lets you take regular PHP extensions, run them natively right on HTVM. Um, that was quite an interesting piece of work. Um, and who's, so who's using us then? Well, obviously Facebook's using 100% traffic on HHVM. And we get a couple of visitors a day, so that hopefully is working correctly. Um, we've got a page for people to just sign up and say, yes, I'm using you. Turns out, I do. Just decided to start using us one day. Baidu is like the biggest search engine in, in, in China. Like, that's no small amount. And they just sort of came along one day and said, oh, by the way, we're using you everywhere. Thank you. So, cool. Um, and uh, we've got a few stats for our downloads, our pre-built binaries, over 30,000 downloads in June. Not bad. Not to mention people are downloading from GitHub. So, uh, that's just my aside. I'll, I'll get back into more cool things. Um, how does HHVM actually do what it does? How does it actually, you know, why is it faster? Well, here's roughly a picture of what PHP 5 does. PHP 5, with an opcache, by the way, I'm not even going to consider without an opcache, and you shouldn't be either, um, compiles a page into bytecode, and then at runtime, it steps through that bytecode to actually perform actions. Um, the next time you come to a page, it says, hey, has that page changed at all? If it has, I'm going to recompile that and do it again. But if it hasn't, I'm just going to reuse that bytecode. That's what PHP 5 does. That's actually what we do in what we call interp mode. That's with the JIT turned off, just running regular PHP code. And then we throw this JIT on top of it. What's a JIT? JIT's a just-in-time compiler. This takes those bytecodes and it turns them into native machine code that the CPU can run directly without any extra interpretive layer in the middle. So, you know, it's like, I'm going to pick up my keys versus I'm going to build a machine to move over and grab my keys and pick them up and move them to another location. It's a lot less work. It's a lot faster. It's a lot more efficient. Although, I got to say, building a machine to pick up your keys sounds kind of cool. Uh, we have a third mode in here, which we call repo authoritative mode. I got a little too close to the mic there, sorry. Um, this is sort of where we take all of your PHP source code and we compile it all of it ahead of time straight to bytecode. Why would we do that if we can do it at runtime? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it makes distribution of your application a lot simpler. Instead of throwing up a big tarball that you unzip on your production server and it takes a while to put files in different spots, we just put one massive SQLite database in place and then we send a hub to the server and it says, oh, new database in place, okay, invalidate my caches, keep running. We don't actually have to stop HHVM to reload the site. That's pretty cool. But another good reason is that we can spend more time thinking about our compilation process. If you're compiling at runtime, you have to make sure that compiles really fast. Otherwise, you know, your first user is going to be waiting a really long time for your page to load. So we do that compile ahead of time. We make more optimizations. We put the bytecodes together in different ways and stack things differently and wind up with something that runs a lot faster. So that gives us another 10 to 25% performance, and that's pretty cool. So... What do these steps all look like? Well, again, for the first few stages, we actually look identical to PHP 5. We go to a compiler. In, in the case of PHP 5, it's called the Zend Engine. We turn it into bytecode. We go, uh, we cache that bytecode and optimize it. In the case of PHP, that would be opcache plus, where it does its optimizations. Um, and, then the and then the similarities stop there. PHP runs that bytecode as is. 
We take that optimized bytecode and we call it, turn it into something we call intermediate representation. This is sort of a meta definition of the control flow of the application. Um, it, they're similar to bytecodes, they're just sort of um, a bit more uh, graph connectedy of saying, all right, I've got a condition here of some kind, and based on the result of that condition, I'm going to branch to this block of code or that block of code. And we wind up with these little things we call tracelets, which define um, sections of code that have uh, predictable inputs and outputs and types. So at the beginning of a tracelet, we're going to make sure that we're in the right kind, and then we're going to consider all those types known throughout the rest of that tracelet until we exit. Um, this is all compiler theory, and I'm not going to go too much below that because I did rate this as a beginner talk. Um, we take, then take that intermediate representation and we optimize it some more. We say, well, okay, now that we know that this jumps to that, jumps to that, jumps to that, and we've got exceptions here, here, and here, let's reorganize those, put them into more sensible tracelets that go down the same hot path every time, define the rest of the cold path somewhere else so that we don't have to you know, put them somewhere they don't matter as much, um, and get them together. Then we go into what we call virtual assembly. This is almost machine code, but it's more sort of like the common pieces that all architectures of modern processors tend to share in common. All CISC processors anyway. We're not worried about RISC processors because that never happened. Um, <laughs> we, we then take that and we shove it into what we call a backend. A backend might be something like LLVM, uh, if you're familiar with that at all, to turn that into real machine code. Um, we don't currently use LLVM for that. We have our own, like, homegrown backend for that. Um, it does much the same job, though. Once we've got that machine code, then we can run that straight on the processor every single time. It's only this last step that gets repeated. All those steps leading up to it, those are all compile time steps that just get happened once right when you start up your process. End of technical session, I promise. Let's talk about real-world performance. Because that's what we care about. We don't care about how fast Fibonacci runs, right? We can probably just put the entire Fibonacci se sequence on our disk out to infinity and still have room left over for Tetris. <laughs> what do the stats actually look like? Well, we care about Drupal here, right? So uh, this website here, WebRockerDE, did some analysis of running Drupal 7 on HHVM versus PHP 5.5, and they got some pretty stark numbers, right? These are pretty freaking impressive. Uh, requests per second, the one on the left, we want the higher numbers. That looks like a 10 to 1 gain when caches are on, right? That's pretty huge, right? Um, response time, we want lower numbers because we want that page to come through faster. With caches on, 0.4 microseconds versus 915.6 microseconds. Huge difference. Obviously, the winner is chosen, right? Obviously. Never believe somebody else's benchmarks. Benchmarks can be great, and some people make some really good really hard to argue with benchmarks, but never just like look at the first article you see and say, oh, obviously that's right. Because this guy made a lot of mistakes. I want to show these numbers, but I would be lying to you if I said that they were accurate. Um, 10,000 to one doesn't happen. Um, we do not have quantum processors running this code. This is not realistic information. So bear that in mind in looking at any statistics at all. That said, there are statistics out there, some which aren't quite so grandiose. Um, Daniel Sleuth, the guy who did the Mac port for us, he also is a developer on Magento. Likes Magento a lot. So he did some, some benchmarks of his own. And, you know, he got some decent numbers. Those will look like about 2 to 1 to 4 to 1, depending on the uh, specific endpoint. Not too bad. Um, again, this is response time, so we want the lower ones. Similarly, higher requests per second, so you need fewer servers. All good things. So uh, Christian Stalker, well known in the PHP circles, he did, he did the same thing for Symfony, saw the same results. Awesome kind of numbers. For every graph I can show you here, somebody will be able to show you a graph that says it's not that significant or even PHP is ahead. So do your own performance analysis. And even when you see your own performance analysis, think about some of the places where you actually are losing your performance. Because it may not be about processing. It may be about spending too much time waiting for a database session to come back, which has nothing to do with the performance of the runtime. So really dig deep if performance is what you're concerned about. But who cares about performance? My favorite parts about HHVM have nothing to do with its speed. My favorite parts have to do with all the other things it can do. Hack. Hack is something, it's a sort of 
what we would Facebook would call it a successor to the PHP language. I would call it a new, new distinct language of its own that happens to look a lot like PHP. Um, Hack will take all of. Let me rephrase that. The sort of the core of Hack is taking type hinting, which already exists in PHP, and turning it up to eleven. So we add all of those scalar types that have been missing from PHP type hinting. I think we should add it. People on the internals list disagree with me. Um, specializing certain types, arrays are a great Swiss Army knife workhorse, but they're really imprecise. They just sort of say, I hold data, and that's it. So by specialize them, we say things like, oh, you actually hold a vector of integers. You're, you're not keyed. We don't care about what offset those integers are at. We just know that you hold a bunch of integers. Or maybe we have a associative array that maps a string to a bunch, of, a bunch of associative arrays, which in turn map a string to an object. Uh, this is much more uh, telling about uh, well, the, the contents of that array. It's much more descriptive. And uh, once you have all that kind of stuff, you can start using static analysis tools. What do static analysis tools do? Static analysis tools allow you to write your program, and as you're typing into your editor, before you're ever actually running it, it's going to look at your program and say, wait a minute. You said that this function takes an array of integers. You promised me that. But you're calling it with a float or a boolean or something. That's wrong. So before you even run that, your editor's popped something up and told you, told you, hey, you screwed up. Go fix it. it. Saves a lot of time. What happens when you need to refactor that code five years from now? You don't know the entire code base because Bob wrote it and then left six months later. So. You start changing something, it says, oh, there's all these call sites over there that you didn't know about in some other script. You should fix those while you're at it. And you're like, oh, thank you. I'm not going to break the site and destroy the entire company. Won't that be nice? So what does it look like? Well, here's an example of class, foo. This is a pretty basic class. It's going to store a number in it. It's going to allow you to add to that with a nice little fluent interface. You can add, add, add. Eventually get the number out, which is, of course, the number. All these little green spots, these are the hack notations I've added in. It's not modified the look of the language very much. It's just added extra information. Num, should, as a property, should always be an integer. It should never be anything else. Trying to set it to something else is a mistake. The property to add should always be an integer. Similarly, the property of constructor should always be an integer. That constructor is always going to return void, because constructors don't have meaningful return values. So this all makes sense right up until the bottom when we try to add banana. Bananas do not like being added to numbers. Similarly, Hack's going to look at that and it says, you're passing a string to a function that expects an integer. Why are you doing that? Fix your stuff, man. So we fix our stuff, and we have a nice little class. What else can we do to improve that class? Well, that, that property name there, that's kind of, I won't say boilerplate, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of extra lines that we don't necessarily need in our definition, especially down in that constructor. Because remember, we're saying, all right, we've got a constructor that takes a number, and it's going to set that number to a property called the same thing on the object, which is also the same type. That's excessive, right? Let's define the property to our constructor with visibility. This constructor takes a private antonym. What this is going to do under the hood is it's going to declare a private property on the class of type integer named num, and its value is going to be whatever you pass in there. Less boilerplate, more actual coding. That's good, right? I like that. Let's say we don't want that class to be specific to integers. Let's say we want it to be able to add ints or floats or even strings. Well, we could do different versions of that class. We could have i float, f float, all those different things. Or we can define the class generically. And this is going to be familiar to the Java programmers out there, maybe even the C++ programmers. We have a foo of t. This is not a real class name. This is sort of a, uh, a prototype for a class, if you will. So when you instantiate one of those classes, you'll say new foo. And because you passed it an integer, it's going to try to come up with a specialization which satisfies this prototype for being passed an integer argument. If for, in order for that to happen, t must be an int, so it must be a foo of t. So all the other interfaces match. Get now returns an int, add now takes an int, etc. 
and we can treat that as a you know, foo 123 or foo 3.14 and it'll specialize correctly. Collections, uh, I mentioned arrays are sort of generic buckets for data. Collections allow you to be a little less generic about it. Uh, a vector is always going to have indexes 0 through count minus 1 set. And they're going to be set with the items as you enter them into there. It's very fast, much faster than normal arrays, because internally they're stored right next to each other in a continuous block of data. Regular arrays have to store your data in something called a hash table, which is sort of a smaller array, but each element of that array is a whole bunch of linked list buckets containing the actual data, and it's got to search through this. It's a lot slower. Um, again, sorry, I didn't mean to go too technical on the comp side. Um, we've also got sets and maps, similar sort of storage structures. I'm sure you've seen these in some context already. Um, and everything can be a frozen version of it or a mutable version of it. So you can say, I have a read-only 0 to n minus 1 indexed array of stuff by saying frozen vector stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, async functions. So I was in Steve Rhodes' uh, talk earlier about async stuff, and he said, oh, I bet Sarah's going to mention something about this in HHVM. Yeah, okay. Um, I actually had a, a slide. It was a shorter slide. I added a few more examples based on his presentation. Um, what, what do asyncs do? Asyncs allow you to say, I've got a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be blocking because I have to go to some network resource or I have to go to disk, which seems like it should be immediate, but it's actually not. Um, it can take some number of milliseconds to get. I want you to go out and pr proceed to do all those things at the same time and get those their results at the same time. So you have a parallelized request instead of a serialized request. That can save you a whole bunch of time if you have a lot of backends. Um, when I was at Yahoo, uh, I was working on our search front end. We had to go to 50 different backends over the course of a, every single request. And obviously, we couldn't do those serially just with a bunch of file gate contents. We had to do this whole decision tree sort of thing in C++, and it was very hard to maintain. I was the only one who knew what to do with it, and I am afraid of what they're doing with it now because nobody else <laughs> understands it. We could have done that entirely in PHP using async by just saying, Go fetch that request. Go fetch for that request. Oh, you're done with that request. Okay, let's make decisions and go off to the next ones. Um, this is some convoluted, um, complicated examples, but really what it comes down to is uh, soon, not quite yet, you're going to have functions like curl async that you can just say, curl, go deal with all this async BS for me and just get me the data. Get all these pages at the same time, join them together, and give me a nice array of results. Or you can write stuff that depends on curl async. You can do something that uh, creates a post version instead of the default get. So you can send the curl async a handle. Or you can do raw uh, socket things. I've got an example going to an NTP time server. We do a socket send to to say give me a time, and then we wait uh, on this stream async select function until something interesting has happened. Once that happened, this routine starts back up and we can do the receive. We're not actually blocking. We're doing what's called cooperative multitasking. It's pretty cool, but it's complicated. So that's sort of like a quick view of some of the extra features. Um, how do you actually turn your site into a hack site? You've got all this PHP code, right? I, I assume everybody's got two to, uh, 10 to the seventh lines of code out there, right? That's a lot of code to convert. You don't want to have to do that all yourself. Well, we've got a tool. It's called the Hackificator. It's a fun name. <laughs> We run, you run the hack of a cater on, at the base of your tree, and it's going to go out through all of your files, and it's going to say, well, I can see that you're setting an integer into this variable, so it's probably an integer. And it's going to go down through the function and say, yeah, yeah, this is always treated in an integer context. It's probably always going to be an integer. I want to trust that it's an integer. So it's going to start making assumptions. These green spots, it knows the exact type because it's being set. It knows null is a null. It knows new foo is a foo because nothing else can come out of it. So they're green, they're known. On the first pass, it says, well, this particular function, let me go in the other direction. From G, F is always called with an integer, right? So it says, okay, F almost certainly always takes an integer. So I'm going to declare it as an integer, but I'm going to put this little at symbol by it. Everybody knows what the at symbol does, right? It's error suppression, like it is anywhere else in PHP. This says, 
I'm pretty sure it's an int, but don't freak out if it's not. Just log it to, to the error logs, and we'll deal with that later. And so you're probably thinking, oh, God, I have to go and I have to sift through error logs. No, Hackificator knows how to read error logs. You put this stuff in, it's going to run through a few cycles to sort of work out what all those types are, and then you run your site for a week or two. Nothing's going to break, because there are no hard errors in this. It says, I think these are, I think these are. At the end of the week, run Hackificator again, tell it where your log files are, and it's going to say, huh, none of these were problems. I'm going to take those ads off and trust that they actually are legit. Or it'll say, oh, that one is a problem. You should go and look at that one. I don't know what's going on there. And suddenly, your entire site is hackificated. We've used this tool a little bit. Uh, we started off with sort of a, a gentle piece of the code base. Took 10% of it. Said, let's hackify these files. We use these a lot. We can really tell if something weird is going on there. And everything works OK. And then something interesting happened. Instead of another big leap from whatever 9% it is to 13, there's a slight slope there, isn't there? Because the developers around Facebook, who haven't even been told very much about Hack yet, have seen it. And they're like, hey, that's a good idea. I should type my stuff as they're putting new diffs in. So by the time we get to our second test, we're going to do another 3 or 4%. We've already got reached 10. So we do another big leap with the hackificator. It gets us a little bit more information. And then this, this slope happens some more because people are like, hey, I'm writing diffs, but I'm interacting with this hack code. I can type everything, and that's going to save me trouble in, in the long term. Repeat that a few times. We get all the way out here to, what is that, October 2013. We're at about 96, 97% hackificated. That's probably about where we're going to stay. Um, the code works really well. All those apps have disappeared. The, war the warning logs are not complaining about it. Why aren't we going through the last little bit? Well, Hack does a few interesting things to be as pure as it is. Um, it's got three modes. Uh, in one of the, the default mode is what we call, uh, what do we call that? Uh, partial mode. In partial mode, you can still get away with a lot of PHP-isms. Um, you can use uh, certain band syntax, um, like variable variables, which tend to screw up uh, Hack quite a bit. Um, it's, it's sort of a soft mode. Uh, you can also run top-level statements. So when you first come into a page, you know, it's only those top-level statements that get run. It's not like there's no main function. So your entry point has to be at least a partial, because you are going to run those top-level functions. Your library functions can be what we call, um, is it decal, I think? Um, this is the more, no, it's strict. Uh, we go into strict mode. In strict mode, all the rules are applied. You cannot do really weird variable, variable, variable function. Um, you have to use specific um, or and and operators because of the weird precedence rules. Um, you have to do a few things which feel annoying at first, but once you've done it a couple of times, it really doesn't hurt at all because you're making a lot cleaner code. You're making code that you can look at in five years and understand what the heck it's doing, which you can't necessarily do with PHP. Um, I have a lot of old code that I have no idea what it does. And I will admit that. Um, if you want to more, know more about the modes, I can go into that a little bit later. Uh, one other feature we have is something called user attributes. Um, these are similar to Java user attributes. I think C Sharp also has them as well. Uh, we use the double less than, double greater than to denote them. You can throw them onto functions, methods, and classes, and eventually properties and constants, though I do, for some reason we don't support that yet. Um, what this is, this is just notations. It's the kind of stuff you might put in comments, but it's programmatically discoverable. I've got a few comments in here. Um, author of this function is S. Goldman, so you know who to punch when you see this and think, why do I have a function that returns a constant number? Oh, it's a clowny function. Okay, I won't worry about that. Then. And you can explore, explore that. And you look at that and you think, oh, what's the point of that? This doesn't really do anything particularly interesting. Well, um, there's one spot that I'll show you particularly good, but some of these uh, annotations actually have meaning. First one I'll show you is what I call dynamic minimalization. Let's say you have a function with no side effects. For the same set of inputs, it will always produce the same set of outputs. Um, get user, for example, is always going to go to the database and get that user's data. Um, let's assume it's a read-only database for the moment. 
um, based on a particular input. So in my example, I said mark equals get user four. That happens to be Mark Zuckerberg's user ID. Later on in the program, we've got dollar user happens to be set to four, and we want to get whoever that user's data is. So we'll say get user user ID. It's going to just go straight to the cache. It's just automatically caching the stuff for you. You don't have to have like statics in your function and things like that. It's just very clean memoization, which is pretty cool. Static memoization goes one step further. Static memoization actually resolves itself at compile time. For some functions, when you pass them a constant string in, you will every single time from here to the end of eternity get the same value out. Good example of that is the MD5 function. MD5 with the empty string is always a four four something or other. I can't remember it off the top of my head. If I could, that would be really impressive, and I should do that next time. Um, that will always be the same value unless there's a bug. Um, if there's a bug, then God help you. So what we do is we call MD5 with quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, whatever. During compile time, it's going to call the MD5 function with that constant input, get an output, and that'll be in, in your uh, that'll be in your output. It won't do a function call. And function calls are actually kind of expensive, so that's good. Saves a lot of time. Um, these, those are just performance things. There's a few other uh, um, user attributes that have special meaning, particularly native, which I'll show you at the end. What else have we got? Null safe method calls. This just went in like three days ago. I posted it on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, I have to add this to my presentation. Okay, fine. I'll put this in. By the way, memoize was added four days ago. I just added that to my presentation, too. What do null safe method calls give you? Is there an RFC for that? So we've RFC, the question was, was there an RFC for that for PHP? Um, we've RFC'd some of the things that, some of the ideas that we've come up, but, but not every one of them, and that's one that we just didn't do. Um, a few people replied to me on Twitter and said, hey, that's pretty cool, when is it coming to PHP? Um, there probably is going to be an RFC for it. Um, sorry, for, for null safe or for memoize? Uh, for this one, null safe. Um, So, well, my answer is the same for both memoize and uh, null safe. Uh, memoize is going to be more complicated because PHP doesn't have user attributes. But um, in the case of null safe, yes, there is an RFC somebody's working on um, to introduce it to PHP. What null safe does, uh, let's say if you have a fluent call like on that first line there. Foo equals a new foo. I immediately want to call the bar method on that, and then the baz method on the output of that, and then a blong method on the output of that. It's a really clean calling interface. You can see exactly what's going on from step to step. It's really easy to read code, hopefully, if your methods are well-named. But if there's an error at any point in there, you can run into some issues. Now, there's different ways for you to handle these errors. You might throw an exception, which this will deal with fine, but you have to catch that exception somewhere, obviously, and deal with it. Uh, you might return null instead of the next object, in which case this is going to fail badly, because you're going to have method call on a non-object. Um, and you can handle each of those in these various ways. Try catch. That's some boilerplate. It kind of looks ugly. Um, gets in the way of your coding. Or you might have, or maybe what you're calling doesn't return exceptions. Um, or you might deal with your nulls by having a bunch of nested ternaries. Really ugly and a lot harder to read. So we said, you know what? Let's just make a way to do this simply. Let's introduce what we we're calling the null safe object over operator. So we knew up a foo. We call bar on it because we know we have an actual foo at that point. And then because we might have a new, we might have an object, we do question mark arrow bar, question mark arrow blong. And at any point, if we don't have an object to do the method call with, we just return null out of the entire expression. And null is your error state. And that null can happen at any point along this call cycle. Um, I have already already used it in some of my scripts because I have basically the equivalent of the safe but ugly all over some of my code. XHP, that's one of my personal favorites. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, am I going over time at all? Because uh, No, we're good. Um, so XHP is our XHTML for PHP. Um, this is not specific to HHVM. There's actually an extension. You can do this with regular PHP, so this applies to everybody. Uh, XHP's job is a fewfold. One of them is to uh, make life easier for your UI developers because they don't have to deal with PHP code. They can just actually construct things using these XHTML blocks. Um, it is also a protection against cross-site scripting. Because in regular PHP, you just put stuff into a string. 
Some of that stuff is markup. Some of that stuff is data. PHP doesn't know the difference. It's just going to pass it all straight through. With XHP, it knows, okay, this tag, this is a tag. This is something I want to act on. This variable that dropped in here, it's definitely data because it came in as a variable. So I'm going to apply the correct escaping to it, whether that's URL encode or HTML special cards or whatever, or HTML entities if you prefer. Um, the story I'm going to tell you about this, when I was working at Yahoo, I was hospitalized briefly. Um, I was in the hospital for about a week. And I had my laptop with me because you can pry that from my cold dead fingers. And I was, had one of those uh, button things where they give you morphine or something cool like that, but you can only do it every so often. So I was really, like, wired up. Middle of the night, I wake up, and I said, there was an XSS in Japanese search. Because I had a dream. I pull out my laptop, I punch in alert JavaScript, blah, blah, blah. There's the pop-up on Japanese web search. I'm like, God damn it, they did it again, didn't they? Some part of my brain had noticed a commit days earlier. So I call up um, the, up, the other main person who takes care of search, and I say, here's your repo, fix it. Grapefruit. <laughs> Grateful. That's what I was going for. Um, drugs are great. I miss drugs. Um, where was I? Oh, yes, XSS. <laughs> I should not have been waking up in the middle of a hospital bed worried about an XSS in Yahoo web search because escaping data is really hard. Filtering data is really hard. It's something that the best of us are going to screw up on at least once. How many of you have written this at some point in your career? You're outputting a block of it. Very nervous hands going up around there. You're block, outputting a block of HTML. And you're embedding this dollar underscore get variable. Um, this is not valid code. Um, this should have been a dollar uh, less than question mark equals um, for embedding some stuff into, into HTML. I need to refix this slide. Um, if this were valid code, it would also be an XSS vector. Somebody could enter in a value like script alert gotcha, and that won't do much, but they can also trick somebody into visiting your site with a script that steals all their cookies and sends them to you. For a site like Yahoo, that's also going to include your yahoo.com email. Or similarly for Google, it's going to include your Gmail credentials. This can lead to very bad things because then all of your accounts are compromised because you can reset all your accounts to your email. These are not things we want to happen. How does XHP fix that? Well, we are never leaving PHP mode here. We are not going out to HTML. What we're doing is we're saying this $4 variable is going to become a form tag, an actual form tag. And that form tag is going to contain some children that are text, some children that are input tags, and those input tags are going to take our get ID and our get password as inputs to them. But this is data as data and tags as tags. If, those, if that get ID contained an, a uh, greater than symbol to close off the tag, it's not going to be interpreted that way. It's going to be turned into percent %34 or whatever the number for greater than is on its way into the input tag. So these excesses just don't happen here. There is a way to get around it, but don't do that. Um, another fun story on that one. So we had a, a, a query string handler. This is actually what caused the excess, by the way. And this, would, this was the only way to get at the, at the data. And you would say, you know, dollar $query parameter arrow stripped, or dollar $query arrow uh, uh, HTML or filtered, or whatever. And it would do, apply the right filters to it. There was also one mode called unsafe. You would think the developers would look at a name like unsafe and think, golly, I don't think that's safe. <laughs> what we forgot is that not all of our developers speak English as their first language. And that is why it happened on Japanese search. Um, that was really sort of my hubris. Um, Facebook had a similar thing for a while. We had a, a query parameter. It was actually named almost exactly the same, but its internal property, the way you act, got to it, was not called unsafe. It was called do not access me or you will be fired. <laughs> how many people want to guess how many people actually accessed that property? It was not zero. Yes, it's a big red button that says, do not push me. There was one at SourceForge right by the front door, and I always wanted to push that button on the way out. I never did. I regret not doing it now. Uh, enough anecdotes. 
What else can you do with XHP? Well, XHP is not just about protecting you from cross-site scripting. It's also about making your UI life easier. You can make your own custom tags. Here I am making a tag called my site colon footer. Um, I throw it into a nice little namespace to protect it from other people call it, creating something else called a footer. Um, this footer tag can take a property called lang and a property called prefix. And then it, when it composes itself, it's actually going to turn itself into a div tag that has all the right classes attached to it. It presents the correctly named home tag, so it'll be either home or casa. It will have additional links to other stuff. And you actually add it to your site down here at the bottom as just my site footer, lang equals Spanish or English or whatever. A lot easier to deal with your UIs on a high level versus, excuse me, versus a low level. I need the water because I'm dry mouth, but that has problems. I like this one because it's fun. I like the blink tag. How many are old enough to have used the blink tag? <laughs> All right, there's the hands. Blink tag was cool until, uh, until the powers that be decided that it was really annoying and nobody should use the blink tag ever. <laughs> Bring back the link tag. We're going to throw that straight into our site in the body, and we're going to reproduce it using JavaScript because damn the man. <laughs> and under construction because obviously... The 90s were awesome. Uh, that's all great, but you have to build all these components yourselves, and that takes time. Let's provide some components right off the bat. Twitter released a whole bunch of really cool libraries called Bootstrap. Bootstrap allow you to create a lot of interfaces that look a lot like the stuff that Twitter uses, because well, Twitter's actually using those interfaces, right? We've got XHP components that wrap every one of those, so you can just put them straight into place. This is a Bootstrap... Um, Jumbotron is what they call this particular tile, type, style in the bottom right corner that we've put a couple of buttons into that are marked up and styled with nice roundy corners, very pretty. And it's cost us very little code, right? It's just a few lines. Um, I'm going to take this moment to do a quick little demo, um, if I can. Let's see. There we are. Um, we've got a UI Explorer that's going to show you all of your bootstrap components. And... Um, uh, what the attributes on them are called, the legal values, and a few examples. Now, I mentioned uses for the user attributes before, right? These examples have user attributes on them. You can't see them here, but they're in the source code, I promise. That user attribute says uh, something like XHP example, parentheses, uh, uses, because this is showing uses of the thing. Through a reflection, we pick that up, and we generate this example page. So this this uh, example of how to use this component is right on the component, and the Explorer just shows you that directly. So warnings are cool. Um, they can contain other things like links within them. That's all great. Um, I literally just added this component last night. Um, nice, cute little progress bars, including animations. Again, this is done with a minimum number of lines. This is that animated warning, warning bar right there. And that's it. So these are pretty cool components. Um, what's another one? Oh, I like the glyph one. Where's glyphs? 200 glyphs you can throw anywhere on your site just by putting in a short little uh, chunk of code. Badge has a good example. A button for unheard mail lights up when you hover over it. It's got an envelope icon and a number of one, two, three. Three lines of very short HTML code. Excuse me, XHP code. So that's the quick 10 cents tour of Bootstrap. You can get to that now, bootstrap.hhvm.com. Um, bootstrap, XHP Bootstrap is not quite released yet. I wanted to open it up today. Um, the guys who run open source at Facebook said we want to open it up on the 15th. So you've got about a week. Um, but you get a preview, so check it out. Um, this is going to be updating. Um, and back in. There we go. So Bootstrap's pretty cool. Uh, the debugger. So a lot of people use Xdebug out of here. Xdebug is a pretty cool uh, extension for PHP. It lets you watch variables, run debug statements, attach to running pages. Uh, we have a, the equivalent to that. It's called HPHPD. It gives you a nice little command line. Do all the same sort of stuff, sort of a GDB sort of, sort of environment. Uh, but we also support the Xdebug protocol in addition to our own. So if you've got an Xdebug client or a editor which speaks Xdebug, like basically every PHP editor out there, 
You can plug them all straight into HTTPM, get the same sort of interaction that you're used to on them. So uh, we just had an intern do that over the summer. So that's also a really new one. Interns are great. <laughs> so a um, few resources for you. Uh, Twitter's usually pretty good for finding somebody. Um, you can also use my Twitter personally if you're interested in doing that, S-A-R-A-M-G. Um, got a bunch of Facebook pages here. We're on IRC, uh, Freenode, HHVM. Um, all these things are replicated uh, from some sim links off of HHVM.com. We're obviously on github.com slash Facebook slash HHVM. Um, yeah, that's the main bit of it. And depending on the time, I will show you extension development. We've got six minutes technically, so let's go for questions first and see what time we have left after that. Uh, right in front. Yes, that also includes profiling. Yes. Um, the question was, does that include profiling? And yes, um, it's through the same X debug interface that supports profiling. Okay. So it's not, not like um, XSprof is in there as well, but no, we're talking like actual call graphs and things like that. Yeah. Um, black shirt. The question was, what's up with Closure Bind 2? Um, I think we haven't finished fixing it. It's, it's on one particular guy's plate to fix, and it, we know it's a problem. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, um, so Closure Bind 2 should be supported. We consider it a bug that it's not supported. Um, it's a question of like prioritization of resources and getting somebody on it to fix it, because uh, Closure Bind 2 is not used quite as heavily in the frameworks that we're using as our benchmarks. Um, all right, up here. You mentioned uh, the tags that you were needing to back on some of the bugs or whatever. What sort of editors for All right, so the question was, what uh, what editors are supported for Hack giving you this immediate feedback on the static analysis of your code? Um, on github.com slash HHVM, there are a few repositories that contain some plugins. There's a Vim plugin, an Emacs plugin, um, our FBIDE plugin, uh, sorry, FBIDE editor, which we haven't released yet, and I wish we would, because it's an awesome editor, um, has built-in support for it. I think, um, and don't quote me on this, that Eclipse is close to having support. I heard that somewhere. I don't know how true it is. Um, Vim and Emacs, man, that's like, you're there. Uh, that, that's my opinion. I like the, I like the terminal. Uh, was there somebody else? I can't see well. Okay, so it's a very uh, fair question, but at what scale does this really make sense? That's a fair question. Okay, well, I mean, like, like I thought I was cool before watching this talk because I have four websites and getting money. Um, and I can say that, you know, at a, a million units a day, it wouldn't have made a huge difference. Our PHP running slowly. Right, so the, the question is, at what scale does, does this really make a difference performance-wise to go HTTPM versus PHP? Um, and you, you offered a great example there. Like, even at millions of hits a day, like, PHP is not necessarily a bottleneck, and I 100% agree with you that. And, and I kind of tried to, to convey that when I was talking about the benchmarks. PHP itself is probably not where you're slowing down for most sites out there. Um, database layers can almost always be sped way the heck up. You know, make sure you're... You've got like maybe a memcached here or something like that to actually keep the hot data close to you. Um, you know, make sure you're caching your output. If you don't have to recreate the same page over and over again, don't. Most of Wikipedia's pages that it serves up are coming out of a cache. You're hardly ever actually hitting the PHP behind it on Wikipedia. It's the writes and the logged in users where, where that matters. So at what point does that matter? It matters on how much uh, optimization you've done for your site. Have you done have you reached all of that low-hanging fruit and gotten to the point where you're now waiting for PHP to go from function call to function call or to uh, you know, come back from a, a, a blocking uh, read request somewhere? Like, I don't... I, my coworkers would say that performance is everything when it comes to HHVM um, because they are, you know, they are actually taking servers out of rotation with every single diff that they put in because of the scale that's being operated at and the fact that we've done all of these other things already. We did these things long before 2010 came around and we decided to even try this. Um, only you can answer that question, dude. I mean, <laughs> um, use perf tools, you know, find out, find out where your site's at. 
And I just threw out, dude, I've been in Southern California too long. I need to throw a hella out there. Yeah, there. Northern California, hella. Ah, okay. Uh, back there? Uh, the robot. I don't know them well, to be honest. Um, the the article I put up there earlier uh, with the heart um, that actually talked about some of the specific things the guy had to do to get Drupal seven running on it. Um, as I understood it, they weren't too horribly arduous. Um, but if you if you look that one up, or if I just jump back to that page, which is way back here, a little further. There we go. Um, Drupal's drink some Red Bull. Go Google for that if you can't get the short URL into, out of that. Um, he covers exactly how he does the setup, so that, that should get you there. I certainly believe so, yeah. So the question was, um, given the assumption that the, the developer efficiency and the improvements to language are more important than performance, do we have any metrics on um, how that has actually impacted, particularly at Facebook, um, for reducing bugs and, and making better code? Uh, no, is the short answer to that. Um, it is definitely made for happier developers. Um, I'm sure some, well, I shouldn't say that. I hope somebody has actually done that research. I don't have it, I'm sorry. Oh, way in the back. That's a great question. Uh, do we intend to keep up with future versions of PHP or uh, are things gonna branch out or, or die off particularly? Um, Nobody can answer that. Um, there are people within my team who would love to see HHVM become PHP 8. That's certainly a possibility. Um, Rasmus Lerdorf has actually said there's no particular reason that in the future that couldn't happen. Um, there are a few things that HHV needs, HHVM needs to do for that to happen, such as run on more platforms um, and have a better, broader support and certainly higher usage. So we have like a pickle sort of thing um, for all those weird extensions. Um, the other end of that is potentially PHP just getting so much better at speed that the per performance doesn't become an issue and picking up enough of those extra language features that you can get that good developer efficiency out of PHP natively. For me, that would be a great outcome because I would love to see PHP thrive. Like the PHP ecosystem as a whole, I want to see thrive. And if that means, uh, you know, the, the reference PHP implementation being the one who wins, and I put that in air quotes, um, then that's good. Um, if that means HHVM becoming part of PHP, then that's good. Um, if that means HHVM getting forked somewhere and having PHP 7 plus HHVM FB plus HHVM other, that's also potentially good. Because if we look at what effect HHVM has had on PHP in the past year or two, I think it's been a really positive one. Um, PHP NG, uh, the next version of PHP that's coming out, is going to be PHP 7 because we're skipping 6 because that's a long story and you ask me if you want to know what it is. Um, PHP NG has been some really great speed improvements. Like, they did a really good job of that. They're actually giving us a run for our money on performance and they don't even have a JIT yet. That's impressive. And... <laughs> I don't have confirmation of this, but I really want to believe part of the, that reason is because HHVM was on scene. Because we were there saying, we're faster and having the numbers to prove it. And somebody said, you know what? PHP can do better. PHP should do better. PHP will do better. And here we are. We're going to have a PHP 7 that runs everybody's code faster and better. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah, we are out of time, I'm sorry.